there was a lot of uh, effort uh, from some individuals to create community networks in the 1980s and 1990s, and it never really caught on except maybe Santa Monica. And then next door came along, and it's sort of the, the parody of community networks. Anyway, what, what I wanted to say was that, A, there are plenty of, of good, healthy communities out there, but they're sort of like uh, raisins in, in, embedded in the, uh, a, a very uh, scary loaf of bread in that there's a lot of ugly stuff out there as well. And then um, I think the, the major complicating factor is Facebook. So many people think that Facebook groups are how you do community. Um, you know, the word for that is enclosure. They, they, they are trying to convince people that they are the web and they are the, the social operating system. So one of the things that I'm uh, promoting about the, the pandemic situation is since, since so many people are forced to use online media, both professionally and socially, can we take this opportunity to build out green space? Because I don't think we're going to be able to do away with Facebook's enclosure, but you know, you could you can start a subreddit, you can use discourse. Um, there's lots of communities on on Twitter. Um, so to encourage people to to do that, I, I don't know what to do about all the bad stuff, but I think that uh, we can encourage people to use the opportunity to start some healthy online communities. It seems to me, and this is my experience with Facebook groups and other tools similar to it, that it's not at all easy to create a meaningful community. Well, well, part of it is that it's, it's never easy to do that. Um, people are so distracted and have so many claims on their attention. You have to have a really strong sense center of gravity. Hey, if you're, you're diagnosed with cancer, suddenly you have a, a very strong motivation to join a um, cancer support group. But otherwise, um, everybody is, is overwhelmed. Um, you need to have a, a center of gravity that's strong enough to attract people and, and keep them there. And you got to set it up right. You, you need to have rules of behavior that people will agree to before they join. And, they, and you need to specify how they'll be um, enforced. And, uh, and you need to give everyone a second chance and nobody a third chance under, under those rules. In, in my experience, the number of people you lose because they perceive that you are censoring them is dwarfed by the number of people who won't participate because they're afraid to stick their head up because somebody's going to, to shoot something nasty at it. So I, I should let uh, Gina, Gina pitch in. No, I was just going to add, I mean, you, you make an interesting point, but um, I would argue that depending on what your needs are, maybe you are fulfilled by some of those groups on Facebook, good, bad, or indifferent, depending on the lens through which you see the information coming, right? Well, uh, certainly there are a lot of really healthy uh, Facebook groups and a lot of really unhealthy ones. Uh, one of the, the problems is just the, the, the user interface for groups, I, I actually went to Facebook and talked to their social scientists a couple of years ago and complained about this and nothing has been done about it. There must be a business reason for it. But you know, if you, got a, um, you post something and people comment on it, mm -hmm. the, the, the next post that is commented on goes to the top. So, and there's no way of keeping track of them. So if you got 500 people in your group, three minutes later, your, your, your post is buried. Um, this was a problem that was solved by BBSs and conferencing systems decades ago. They, they, the, the system should keep track of what you've read and show you only what's new and only what you want to read, and they don't do that. Um, Not anymore. They used to a very long time ago, um, but then they changed the algorithms, and they continue to change them, and they, you know, I, I think most of it's based on advertising dollars, so. And that strikes me that it's a core tension between the social marketers using these technologies and 
others who are trying to build and maintain relationships? Well, it depend, uh, a lot of it depends on the platform, of course. In, in, in uh, Facebook, it's, it's all about collecting information about you and your, your friends. Um, I mean, a big difference now is that since the, the surveillance capitalism e economy has existed, there are all kinds of ways of, find, of, of finding out information about individuals. And, uh, and interestingly, with, with Mark and Node Excel, there's now all ways of looking at who's talking to who and in, in, in what uh, kind of relationships. So it's, a, it's, it's really a, a different world now um, that we've got all of these ways of measuring what, what people are doing. And, you know, some of it is used to make profit off your privacy and some of it is used to make sense of, of what's going on. I would, I would certainly put Node Excel in the, in the, the latter uh, category, but I, I let Mark uh, explain that. Well, I, I guess uh, I come from an era where we used to download our email and we had clients that went to uh, networked resources to servers, collected the data, gave us a local copy, and on that local copy we could analyze and optimize our use of that data as we saw fit. And um, there are no clients for Facebook other than Facebook. And that means that there can never be independent scrutiny. There is no independent external evaluator. There is no accounting service for social media. And in the absence of social media accounting, in the absence of like a quick books for hashtags, you get what you get when you have a marketplace that has no record keeping. And so can you imagine what marketplaces were like before there was double entry bookkeeping? And the answer is there were no marketplaces, there were relationships. And the difference between mercantilism and capitalism is accounting. Because in regimes of accounting, you don't really have to have a brother-in-law. You can now just have a business partner. You don't have to be able to use all these other mechanisms of social control. You just look at the balance sheet and go, you're a bad investment. And you have to be able to trust those balance sheets and, and words like Enron and WorldCom and, and uh, you know, the, the, those are suggestions that um, accounting is a necessary but not sufficient resource in a marketplace. So I don't want to be, you know, a Pollyanna and say, remember Arthur Anderson? No. Do you remember Accenture? They are the same thing. Why did they change their name, right? Enron blew up and their name was signed to the bottom line of every one of those balance sheets. So, but without accounting, Enron never blows up. It just becomes a scam that goes on for, you know, decades. And so we are now in a marketplace of ideas, uh, a social media marketplace. And we need an accounting system. I think that's, I hate to say it, but that, that, that's the delivery guy at my door. I'll be right back. I'm sorry to, it's what working at home is all about. Howard, do those in the government make any kind of a point when they suggest that if Facebook won't, will not do self-regulation, they may need to be forced through regulation to do these kinds of accountabilities? Are you addressing that to me? Yes. I, I don't want to step on Gina here if, she, if she's got something to say. But I, I'm, I'm an extremist. I think that Facebook is a scourge, and I think it should be uh, uh, broken up. Um, I, I think it's a, a, a classic uh, restraint of trade monopoly in that anytime something comes up that, that might threaten their uh, monopoly, they buy it. So um, I, I think it should be broken up. Um, do you think that, I wish it went away. Yeah. Why do you think that hasn't happened? I mean, they did that with the telephone companies years ago. And we continue to see that, I mean, they bought Instagram, they continue to buy up, like you said, other companies that are very similar that could encroach on them. So 
that's always I've always just wondered why perhaps the government hasn't stepped in. Well, you know, I think part of that is the change in the atmosphere in that for a long time, um, social media and Silicon Valley and new technologies were quite rightfully seen as engines of economic growth that brought all kinds of um, wonderful capacities to individuals. It, it took a while for us to, to see, and, and this is true of many, many technologies, it took a while for us to understand the price that we were paying. And also, the, the, the surveillance capital, capitalism part of it is just once that hooked into capital, it just, it, it just overwhelmed everything else. You know, Mark was talking about social accounting systems. Of course, before we had formal accounting systems, um, offline and online, we had social capital. People kept the accountings in their head. Oh, okay, that, that person does favors. Um, if they want a favor, I'll, I'll do it for them. Um, and that worked really well in, you know, uh, uh, rural Italy, where if you broke your, your leg, your, your neighbor would help bring in the crops. And it also, it's one of the things that, that originally excited me and still excites me, in which I, I taught my students, you can do it online. If you find the right group and you uh, are a good citizen in that group, then that group will help you get things done. Well, I think part of the answer to Gina's question also is that the high point of regulation in this country was the 1970s. And by the time we had the statutes in the 1990s for the internet, regulation was generally seen as ineffective. In the broadcast context, it didn't work terribly well. Right. I don't know. I feel like sometimes when we log on to the internet, it is just pure chaos at this point. Um, and, you know, I know that, that some researchers have said that this is just the future. The future is chaos. Do you guys agree with that? That, you know, we are in this perpetual state always? I mean, if you look at politics specifically, I know the, you know, political environment that I grew up in, um, is quite different than what my children are growing up in that we're all living through. This well, and, pass. Mark, you've documented the political polarization on Twitter, and, and I've wondered too, Gina, about where's, where's the center of politics anymore? I don't know. Um, when I was getting ready for our call today, I came across this, this quote from Jonathan um, Rausch, um, which I sort of feel like sums up where we are today. So I'll read it. It's, it's kind of short, but it says, this is about chaos syndrome. So chaos syndrome is a chronic decline in the political system's capacity for self-organization. It begins with the weakening of institutions and brokers, political parties, career politicians, and congressional leaders and committees that have historically held positions accountable to one another and prevented everyone in the system from pursuing naked self-interest all the time. As these intermediaries uh, influence fade, politicians, activists, and voters all become more individualistic and unaccountable. The system autonomizes. Chaos becomes the new normal, both in campaigns and in the government itself. Do you think we're there? <laughs> well, I think that that is exacerbated by the, the, the lack of uh, widespread understanding of how to use the media, um, mm -hmm. how, to, how, to, how to, to navigate so that your experience is what you want it to be, and and you're you're not buffeted by others, um, and also uh, the ability to determine uh, what information is is valid. Um, it's it's pretty clear that it's not a majority of the people online understand how to use it, and and that that makes them vulnerable to people who want to manipulate them but also to, to chaos because they're not in imposing order themselves. Yeah, it, 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 this has been an opportunity for capitalism at a moment when it had declining rates of return. Um, the global capitalist system keeps running out of profit and it keeps finding new ways to extract more. 
and that's been great for it. It just hasn't been very good for us. We are sort of the subjects of it. And so in what way could we now construct information networking resources that serve our needs rather than the needs of those who seek to exploit us? And you know, the first 15 years of this was proof that if you offer free access to a candy store, people just can't self-regulate. And so Facebook, Twitter, YouTube sort of opened their doors and said free candy for all. And we gorged ourselves silly, myself included. You know, my YouTube watch history goes back years. It's a lot of videos about solar systems, I gotta say. Um, but in doing so, I didn't realize I gave away a minute level of detail about myself that builds up into a pattern. The fact that I wake up at around 4.30 in the morning and I check my mail is something that a dozen or more people or institutions are aware of, and I'm not aware of their awareness. And so it's this asymmetry that's really interesting and powerful, and you should assume the asymmetry, but it's not necessarily something we should just accept. I, I went to my electric company's website and they said, would you like to see your electric bill detail? I said, yes. Uh, here it is at the month. Would you like to see it at the week? Yes. Would you like to see it at the day? Sure. Would you like to see it at the minute? Oh, wait, you know when I wake up and turn on the kettle every day? Yeah, every day. One of the um, most eye-opening experience I do in my social media class with my students, I, I show them a program that allows them to see every time they go to a website, what that website, the information that is being collected on them. And so why, for example, um, you know, uh, you start to get ads for travel at, you know, spring break time. It's because of your habits that you've, you know, done over the, over you know, years. And so there's this algorithm that is based on your digital footprint. So it understands what you're looking for, who you're connecting with, you know, um, even classmates, right? So when you start to see things spread over from a conversation that you had and you're searching something in a class. And so I have to say most students are pretty shocked. And I do that on day one, just to say like, this is what you don't understand. You're giving away every day. Yeah. Yeah. So we are giving away an enormous amount of information and we don't get to see what's seen. And I would say my focus has been to try to collect all these bits and pieces to derive meaning and insight into them for my own purposes mm -hmm. as the end user. I, I wanna collect all my mail. I want all my tweets. I wanna see if there's any value to be seen in it for me. And you know, my inclination is to think there must be because there's a lot of PhD data scientists on the other end of the wire who do nothing but squeeze insight in and value out of that click stream, that tap stream. So if this is that valuable, maybe a public bit service is something useful. Uh, I think we're just getting to the point where we understand that the word net has two very different meanings. One in which you are connected to others and the other in which you are caught in a net. And right now, I think the balance has shifted to the meaning caught in a net, not networking, but being networked. <laughs> and so we know that the tools are powerful and we know that community, online community, virtual community, collective action through cyberspace generates value. It does, not in question, it's just that it, that process can be invaded and disrupted and it can be mm, corrupted to the point where your work is actually generating more value for others than it is for yourself or for your community. And so it seems reasonable that we would go through periods of monopoly before coming back to competition, that we would go through a kind of exploitative phase before coming back to a recognition of what needs to be rec uh, regulated. It seemed free and easy, it's not. So uh, we need to recognize that if you just let these things run rampant, what you're gonna get is fascism. Howard, 30, 35 years ago, were we too optimistic? Were we naive? Or is it just taking more time than we might've thought? I'm thinking about 
Mark's tool because we've been watching the Black Lives Matter hashtag for years now since Ferguson. And it's only now that there's an inkling of that this conversation has risen to the level of potentially a, a point of progress. Oh, 35 years ago, there were people who, like myself, who were both enthusiasts and aware of where it could go off the rails. Um, I had a national syndicated column that I wrote about it. And I had a book in 1993 called The Virtual Community that's often used as an example of uh, unbridled enthusiasm for social media. But the last chapter is called Disinformocracy. And it talks about the ways that this could go off the rails. What I didn't foresee and what I don't think anybody else really foresaw was the, the combination of um, uh, big data um, uh, and data mining and uh, commercial application of that, that information. What we knew, and I, I wrote about the fact that, uh, for example, when you cross a bridge and you use a transponder, um, you've left a little uh, digital breadcrumb. When you use your credit card, you leave a little digital breadcrumb. We knew that 35 years ago. It wasn't clear that every click that you would make in the, in the future would, would create a, a detailed dossier that would be part of a collection of dossiers of literally billions of people. And I think things happen at that scale, both socially and, and computationally, that was hard to see. And, and you know, uh, 35 years ago, uh, enthusiasts understood that eventually it would not just be words on a screen, that we would have sounds and we would have images and we would have video. I don't think anybody predicted YouTube that, you know, hours of amateur or user created video would be uploaded every minute. Um, just the sheer scale of what what has happened, I think, was some uh, something that we didn't foresee the uh, effects of scale, I think. It would seem in the here and now that facial recognition technology, biometrics, takes it to a pernicious level. Well, uh, again, um, I wasn't the only one writing about this uh, 35 years ago, but you know what? Nobody really cared. Um, and I understand uh, when, when Amazon started recommending books to me and I realized that Amazon was tracking what I was looking at, I thought, okay, useful. Um, and that has multiplied. But do you think that an everyday person really understands that whole idea of the tracking piece? I mean, there has, there's like some level of digital literacy that we're, we're missing, right? We, it needs to start in K through 12 and, you know, lead into college, et cetera. But I think about, you know, my mom or, you know, um, my parents, or, you know, aunts, uncles that don't really fully understand what all of that means. It's a nice convenience or, you know, hey, Alexa, and that's a nice convenience to them, but they don't understand, to your point, Mark, what they're giving away. And, and to your point, our little bits of information, um, the breadcrumb trail that you were talking about, Howard. I think it's a lot to ask of the general population. And I think it's an abrogation of the responsibility of governments to protect their populations. And it would be like saying that, our uncles and aunts should really have a better understanding of chemical toxicity and be ready to make choices in the grocery store based on the food handling practices and the ingredients. And we did that already. And, you know, Upton Sinclair, the jungle, you know, they, they, it was rampant poisoning. It was rampant rot and filth. And it just turns out that if there's a low road to go, enough people will take it. That you're going to need to put up a barrier on the low road. And right now on the internet, all low roads have no tolls on them. 
and anybody can take the low road. The government can actually help though, because I mean, we saw when Facebook and um, some of the other leaders, Google, Amazon, um, were being questioned, you know, in front of Congress, they couldn't even understand basic elements. Yeah, but, so, but in the mid 90s, we used to have an Office of Technology Assessment that would have provided the proper amount of briefing to a politician who, again, yeah. is a politician and does not need or should have detailed information about information technology any more than they should understand nuclear physics in order to govern our nuclear weapons policy. But they do need scientific advisors. And we disinvested for 30 years. I mean, when was it? 96, 97? It was sometime during the contract with America that we axed the Office of Technology Assessment. We used to have a Congress that could actually turn to real experts who would tell them. And so can government regulate this? Yes. Are they currently prepared to do so? No, I saw those court, uh, the, the testimony and uh, I was reminded of a quote from a slightly different context, the Boeing uh, papers that were released about the MAX and they, in that, in that, uh, those documents mentioned that presenting to Congress is, or, or to their regulators, to the FAA regulators, is a lot like watching dogs watch TV. Mm, so, right. okay, so they have no respect for their regulators, but does that mean regulation doesn't work? No, it means that we had no respect for our regulators. We let them be cut. Right. You need highly paid, highly educated, highly trained, highly experienced, people to regulate the aeronautics industry. Same could be said of the information technology and communications industry. Absolutely, no, I don't disagree with you. Yeah, I mean. So it is doable. I, I think we have been led to believe nothing can be done. And that's a great conclusion to come to if you don't want anything done. Good point. With, so. with the development of natural language happening at, at a rapid pace, and Gina mentioned the ever-changing algorithms, Howard, aren't we gonna need regulation of the code itself to make a dent in this? Uh, you know, when you, you, you talked about Alexa, I thought about the uh, anomaly that, that happened a while back where uh, it, thought, it thought someone had said the, the wake up word, it recorded a conversation and then it, it sent it uh, to a random person in their address book. Um, I think we're just going to see more and more of that and the, you know, to say nothing of the internet of things when, when your appliances get in on that. Um, I don't think even experts are, are, are able to understand the, 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 the world that we're in. I do think though that uh, I, I'm, I don't really uh, know what the, 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 the political will is going to require to regulate, but um, I do think that it's important to educate. And, and now we've got this collision between the absolute necessity to, to teach, uh, I'd say middle school kids, uh, how, how to determine what's real and what's not online and how to understand how they're being exploited online. But our formal education system is so conservative in terms of, of changing the the curriculum, where are you even going to fit in the, a class to do that? So the other issue is, is critical thinking. In order to really thrive online and not be taken for a ride, you have to be able to think critically about the information you're, you're seeing. And my mother was a teacher. So 50, 60 years ago, she taught critical thinking and she was taken to task by the PTA because it was a communist plot and it's still seen as a communist plot. And, you know, I understand that, that teachers and parents find it difficult to encourage their kids and their students to question their authority. It's, uh, it's time consuming and, and frustrating. So we have a collision between the need for critical thinking and the reluctance to, to engage in it. So Jeremy, to, um, to appreciate Howard's time and um, Mark's time, because I know we're, we're running short here. Did you have one last final question or thought? Well, we've 
batted around law, but we, we haven't said anything about the need for professional ethics. Is there a role for that within the computing industry? I would argue yes, but I would say we're a long ways off at this point. I mean, I think the first site of, you know, or the first step was, was creating some of these ethical boards that then a week later immediately collapsed. Um, so, so yeah, there's definitely need. I mean, you, you see in, in any type of, you know, algorithm, there's, there's racial bias there. <laughs> You know, there's lots of issues. So um, I think that's an area in the next five years that will really take off. I actually have a book in the other room on ethical com uh, computing. So there, there are people who are um, envisioning what that would mean. Again, my bias is about education. I think that uh, um, Software engineers ought to have a little bit more understanding of how humans operate and how societies operate and the history of technology and, and how things are, are created for one purpose and they're repurposed for another one. Um, I think just the mindset of thinking about what the impact of what you're, you're doing um, is largely absent from engineering. Um, and that ought to change. I'm going to suggest that uh, America offers uh, a very clear path to resolution, and that is litigation. Um, what we need to recognize is that harm is done, and once harm is done, we can seek remedy. And so what is really needed is the ability to specify what harms are done so that we may then seek judgments to remedy. And I'm thinking very specific things like the fact that ProPublica has now done two, three exposés showing that you can easily walk up to Facebook and violate the Fair Housing Act, that it's a feature to violate the Fair Housing Act, to select the ethnicity of the people who will see the advertisement for the apartments that you're offering to rent. And that that was pointed out 18 months ago, and again, like nine months ago, and again, several months ago, and not much changes. And I don't think anything will until we get a good lawsuit. When there's a couple of hundred billion dollars on the table, you'd be surprised how much behavior change follows. And so, I think we need to look deep into our American soul and see the message there for all of us, which is sue them. <laughs> and that's what we need. We need somebody to help build the class action lawsuits to sue them for harm. And ProPublica is just one way of doing that, but there are so many other kinds of harm being done. And so if you had a roadhouse at the edge of town and you know that was where all the rough and tumble people went and a lot of crime happened there i'm not sure that the proprietor of this rough and tumble roadhouse gets to say we just serve beer i don't want to police their behavior okay well we are out of time howard but you get the last word because this will be the jumping off point into our panel discussion well, um, when I first uh, got online in the 1980s, I chose as a signature for my email, what it is, is up to us. And we've been talking a lot about how it's not really up to us, it's up to other entities. But you know, um, informed collective action can change things. And the web itself was not created by a corporation and it wasn't created by the government. It was created by a lot of people putting up web pages and linking to each other's web pages. That's why I keep calling for uh, green space. Move out of Facebook, um, use discourse or, or, or set up a, a discord server, get somebody who's a little bit more technically knowledgeable to do it for you and run, run your own thing. Uh, and you don't have to surveil the, the people in your community and um, and you can have decent rules and they can behave well and social capital can exist and, and, and people can get uh, 
more done together than they would individually and have a much more pleasant experience than they do on the wild internet. So yes, the wild internet has a lot of ugly stuff in it. Go out and create your own. Well, Howard, I always find it an honor and a privilege to be able to speak to you. So thank you so much for the time that you gave us today. <laughs> My pleasure. Yes, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, got to go. Nice to talk with you all. Bye.